Satan thought that Hitler was the one, and he fulfilled all the requirements to become the beast. And our God is so good that he utilized these horrors to bring the Israelites out of diaspora and back into Israel again. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob, Yaakov's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Thank you so much for joining us today. And today's subject, I wish we didn't have to talk about, but we really need to talk about suffering. I kind of would like to take a break on this one. Can I just leave? Because I, <laughs> yeah, like, I like good news, yeah, but yeah. the harsh news is yeah. just harsh to hear, isn't it? The eighth stop is the most somber. Uh, the, the reminding of all of the devastation and the pain that the Jewish people have gone through, mm -hmm. and then um, the reminder of the worst being yet to come with the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, Revelation 13.10 says, If anyone is meant for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, by the sword he must be killed. Here's the perseverance and faith of the Kedoshim. The saints, the saints have to suffer. Those who believe upon Yeshua during the tribulation, the greatest persecution, just like the Jewish people, but all the while the world will be suffering under, under the wrath and plagues that Adonai pours out upon the world. Right now we take you to Israel for the guy's teaching. Let's go there now. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Guys, that beast, the beast, the Antichrist, if you will, is going to bring about such great persecution, uh, murdering not just the saints of God, but God's chosen people, the Jews. This will be the greatest persecution, the greatest holocaust of humanity since the beginning of time. Personally, uh, our family knows about the Holocaust and about persecution. My mother's side of her family are descendants from Austria and from Germany, and most of them lost their lives in the Holocaust. That's right. We need to go tell that story. Come along with us. Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him, the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Verses 9 and 10, guys, it talks about the saints. Now, who are we talking about in this verse? Well, verses 9 and 10 talks about the saints who did not accept Yeshua before the rapture. Yeah. That means they don't have the indwelling in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that means that what they have to do is they have to persevere through this persecution to the end and not give up. The prophets actually spoke two times more about the tribulation, about the terrible day of the Lord, than they ever prophesied about the first coming. That's right. And Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, meaning terrible, paramount, unequaled, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob, Yaakov's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Guys, Jacob, the whole house of Israel, will be saved at the end of the Great Tribulation, but after two-thirds perish. That is astronomical. It says that in Zechariah 13, 8 through 9. Um, guys, to understand the severity of this, of this suffering and persecution, we got to look back to history at the closest related comparison. I think it's the Holocaust, John. All right, well, we're here, brother. Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem. Daniel 7.25 He, the beast, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times, the Moedim, and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time, three and a half years. We're here at Yad Vashem, Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. It's a memorial to the six and a half million Jews that were killed by Hitler's Antichrist regime during World War II. Satan thought that Hitler was the one, and he fulfilled all the requirements to become the beast. He thought through Hitler he could stop the seven feasts, the Moedim, and Shabbat. He could stop Torah. He could kill all God's chosen people. Yet God stopped his plan. It was not the prophetic time. And our God is so good that he utilized these horrors to bring the Israelites out of diaspora and back into Israel again, fulfilling Ezekiel 37's dry bones prophecy.
Revelation 2.13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Satan's throne, the seat of Satan, as some other translations put it. What is Yeshua referring to when he gives this prophetic word to the church of Pergamum? You know, in times past in the city of Pergamum, there was a temple to Zeus, and the altar there was referred to as Zeus's throne. By uh, unbelievers, they would call it Satan's throne because they knew that Zeus and Satan were synonymous with one another. And there was a bronze bull that adorned the top of this altar. And it was here where Antipas was made a martyr because they would perform sacrifices. He was killed for being a Christian. You know, ironically enough, that same altar was being constructed shortly after the time period that Antiochus Epiphany IV committed the first abomination of desolation in 167 BC. Mm. And this mirrored that idol of Zeus that was erected in the uh, temple in Jerusalem, only on a much larger scale. It's a moving sight. People come through the Holocaust Museum and this is a conclusion to see the life that is at the end of the tunnel, the literal light at the end of the tunnel. Well, back to our story, guys. In the late 1800s, German archaeologists and engineers discovered the ruins of that Pergamum altar in the city of Pergamum. And they took it apart and they brought it back to Germany. They created this whole museum around it and they rebuilt the ruins. Well, Albert Speer, Hitler's right-hand man, would go to that museum and he would stare at those ruins and he was drawn to the power. He believed in those ruins. So he designed the Zeppelin Tribune in Nuremberg. He designed it to look just like that Pergamum altar. And from there, Hitler posted these Nazi rallies with hundreds of thousands of Nazis in attendance. And from that podium, Hitler announced his final solution for the Jewish people. Many Bible prophecy experts believe that the beast might utilize this throne. Mm. In fact, that throne's been mobile many times in history. In fact, when we refer to uh, the, the prophecies of Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel 11, it may be the Pergamum altar that he uses. Yeah. It may be that they desecrate the brazen altar and wrap this throne completely around it. Either way, it's a foreshadowing of the darkness to come. Daniel 11, 32 through 35. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help. But many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, to purify them, and to make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Behind us you can see a beautiful monument to those Jews who stood and fought against Hitler and lost their lives during World War II. I believe it's significant because of a scripture that we just read in Daniel. Um, it's a parallel prophecy, guys. It's referring to the Jews who fought Antiochus Epiphanes during that time of captivity, but it also parallels a future uh, battle, if you will, of the saints who fight against the beast during the tribulation. You see, in an ironic twist of fate, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the Jews are not being persecuted. They're worshiping Elohim in the Beit HaMikdash, the temple in Jerusalem. This huge contingent of saints that he just spoke about mm. uh, is made up of those counterfeit Christians before the rapture, yeah. those uh, who had said they believed in Yeshua but had not fully committed their heart. At this point in time, they will have one final opportunity. They will either choose Yeshua and give their life for him, hmm. or they will fight for the beast and lose it forever. It appears that most of these saints actually go to war with the beast in their own way. Uh, they go around the world preaching the gospel of Yeshua. And this is uh, impressive, I would say, because the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth. He's the restrainer that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 8, that was uh, empowering man. But just like with the patriarchs of old, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon like Samson and he would be endued with great strength. They carry out great exploits for Yeshua. But near the end of the tribulation, most of them are beheaded. Revelation 6 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? 
Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. They come to Chile's, going to the Mount of Olives to look at Mount of Olives, he thinks, little do they know, but here at this man's home is the secret entrance to the Tomb of the Prophets. He owns this like in his backyard, he doesn't let anybody know unless you got the monies to do so. It's pretty cool. You can tell them. Do we have the monies? We have the monies, yes. Here at the Tomb of the Prophets, the traditional location believed to be the final resting place of such prophets as Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. You know, the Lord's prophets have endured more persecution and suffering than any other people in history, and they typically leave this earth in a very gruesome fashion by being murdered. Well, throughout history, Josh, the Jewish people have suffered persecution and they've had to hide out in caves such as this from the, the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonians. Let's take a look inside. This is what I picture when I picture a tomb. According to tradition, one of these burial niches is the resting place of the prophet Zechariah. The book of Zechariah parallels the book of Revelation with its prophecies like the terrible day of the Lord, two witnesses, and even the future of the Jews. It's clear, Josh. At the tribulation's three and a half year point, Thing flips on its head for Israel. Uh, their dream, worship in the temple, becomes a nightmare. The false prophet who posed as this Jewish Messiah betrays his own people when the beast marches in with his armies. He breaks the peace treaty and commits the abomination of desolation. They set up this golden image to the beast. It parallels that golden image to Nebuchadnezzar. Many thousands of years ago that was set up. And the false prophet will work signs and wonders uh, performing miracles, giving life to that image, and it will speak. And, and, and it's, it reminds me, Josh, of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that if anybody does not worship the image of a beast, they are put to death. This is where the mark of the beast comes in. You've heard about this, obviously. Uh, if you don't have the mark in your forehead or in your hand, then you can't buy, sell, or trade. Mm. Revelation 13, 16 through 17. It, the false prophet, also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Many people theorize about the technology behind this mark of the beast. Currently, we're leaning toward a bioelectronic implant like an RFID transmitter. They've been testing these sorts of RFID chips in our military for decades, placing them under the hand on their skin, and now commercially with credit cards. We believe that if you take this Mark the Beast, you take on his nature, you receive that seed of the serpent, becoming Nephilim, having super strength and, and power and, and life. And uh, that's why you can't go to heaven if you receive the Mark of the Beast. You're no longer of the seed of man. There's no access to heaven. There's no redemption for you after that point on. And we see that Satan himself, you know, he spreads his seed throughout all humanity uh, because this was his original promise to mankind to Eve. He says, if you uh, eat of this fruit, you're going to be like God. And he's going to promise that, that Godship to everyone on the planet. In the meantime, the ministry of the 144,000 and the two prophets is flourishing. Mm -hmm. They are defying the beast. As spoken about in Revelation 7, 9 through 17. They are leading multitudes to Yeshua. And even though they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they are being justified by their commitment and death for the sake of Yeshua and believing upon Him. Mm -hmm. They were finally going to get to that day, the day that the wicked is judged, but the Father has been holding back just the right time to give everybody the opportunity to make the right choice. Now that reference of Revelation chapter 7 uh, gives us that assurance that the, the trumpet plagues, the bowls of wrath don't happen until after the middle of the tribulation. And when these plagues are poured out, it only affects those who have the mark of the beast. And they will seek death by natural means, uh, and in natural means they can't find it because of this this life that they receive from this perverted, you know, Nephilim blood. Even Satan himself in the shell of a human flesh will suffer. He's not, uh, you know, doing good. This is God's wrath poured out on him and he suffers because of it. But when we get to these 
these witnesses and these saints, all these people who die for the name of Yeshua, they receive a great reward for doing what's right. Revelation 14, 12 through 13. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. Yeshua never minced words for his bride or his chosen people. He guaranteed us persecution. He said, you would be hated among all nations for my name's sake. Revelation 3.10, however, explains that his bride will not suffer the tribulation. However, those who rejected Yeshua's sacrifice before the rapture have to go through it. Let's take a look at some of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. some of the judgments that are going to fall on those unbelieving nations mm -hmm. and on those who've received the mark. Number one, hail mixed with fire falls on the earth, burning up a third of the grass, the leaves, trees, anything green. Well, the second trumpet judgment is something like an asteroid that falls from the sky, hits the waters, and a third of the, the ships, the sea life, creatures, they die. The next one is wormwood, poisons the water. Anyone who drinks the water dies. The fourth trumpet is darkness. It covers a third of a day, a third of a night, a third of a sun, moon, and stars. Number five, Abaddon releases a demonic scorpion army that converges for five months on the earth and brings indescribable pain to anyone who is stoned. The sixth trumpet, day 2129, these four benai Elohim angels that were bound at the river Euphrates back in Genesis 6, they're unleashed. In rage, they gather a 200 million man army of the kings of the east, covering the breadth of Asia, killing one third of the population of mankind on their way to Jerusalem. Matthew 24, 21 through 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The plagues and the punishment were so severe that God had to limit his time stable to three and a half years. Mm. That is God's mercy shining through in the midst of even his judgment. He warned that whenever you see this abomination take place, flee to the desert to get past that tribulation. Yeah, like the desert behind me, this may be the path that the Jews take. They're, they're told in many prophecies to go to a place called Basra. It was gonna be a place of safety, a place of solitude where they would be supernaturally provided for in the midst of destruction. Uh, Daniel 11, 41 foretells that the Basra in Jordan is going to be protected from the beast when he comes in like a flood destroying nations. It says, he the beast will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon, Jordan, will be delivered from his hand. Guys, next week we're going to talk about Yeshua's deliverance when he finally comes to save, not just those people in Basra, but he's going to finish the beast once and for all. Um, the tribulation saints, they do suffer, but it's necessary for them to gain access into heaven. Uh, their act of faith is taken for righteousness and they're purified. And I know this sounds heavy, but... Oh wait, Jeff. Hey! Let's see what he has to say. Well, you earned your living today, gentlemen. This is a tough story. Better you than me to have to tell it, to tell you the truth. I don't even like thinking about it. The Bible does talk about trouble in the world. Trouble in River City, and to be sure, the Jews have been the object of it through time and circumstance, but it culminates at the ragged edge of time. And so it is so appropriate to look at this subject in conjunction with the roadmap to Armageddon. You told the, stuff, the tough story. It leaves me a little somber, but truth be known, per Daniel, uh, that the, the wicked forces prevail until such a time as the Lord presents and then displaces the evil kingdom. Hey, I get the bad news, but I'm in love with the good news. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. It's a very tough subject. It's, it's a very deeply disturbing idea. Anti-Semitism, if you look at it, doesn't have a logical basis throughout history for why so many people groups have had such a deep hatred. We 
want to investigate this because we want to show that the root of this comes from Satan, mm -hmm. that it can't just happen out of thin air. And that's why we have our guest today. Yeah, Olivier Melnick. He's really an expert in the subject of anti-Semitism. That's the focus of his ministry. He's going to tell us more about the history of anti-Semitism. Let, let, let me start by giving you quickly, uh, I think it's important, my definition of anti-Semitism because that will, that will set the stage. Uh, my definition of anti-Semitism and the, two, the first two words are key. Anti-Semitism is the demonic and irrational hatred of the Jewish people and of Israel characterized by thoughts, words, and or deeds against them. And the two key words again are demonic and irrational. Only Satan can make the irrational look and sound rational. And it is demonic, it is from Satan because, and going back to the tribulation now, he wants, uh, he knows that at the end of the seven year tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Jewish people will corporately say, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, and that's when Yeshua comes back. A lot, most Christians actually don't know that Jesus, Yeshua, does not return, not the rapture, the second coming, does not return until the Jewish people call on Him. And that's connected to Je uh, Zechariah 12.10. And uh, so uh, what we have here is we have Satan who knows that his career is going to be an end, be, it's going to be ended when Yeshua returns and he doesn't really care for his retirement plan. He doesn't like when he's going. So if he could stop the Jews, from calling on Jesus, then he, his job is safe. He's going to keep his job, and he's not, and Jesus is not coming back. So that's what he's, through, he's that's what he's been doing for two thousand years, or more than that. He's been behind anti-Semitism, and he's going to try. He tried at the first coming to stop Jesus from coming, and he's going to try again, and he's not going to succeed. But uh, casualties, unfortunately, will take place, and. Uh, the casualties that we, uh, when it comes to the Jewish people, we, we, we look at them from uh, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, that two-thirds of the Jewish people will die during the tribulation and one-third will be refined as silver and gold and that's that one-third that will say, blessed is you comes in the name of the Lord at the end of the seven years. That one-third is going to be become the Israel of God of Galatians 6, 16. And, uh, the, the important part, if I may I add one more thing, the important part about that scripture, I, the first time I saw that scripture, I, I, got, I got really upset. I told my wife, who, she's the one who led me to the Lord 40 years ago, and I, early on I said, you know, I don't like this. This is, this, like two thirds of the Jews are gonna be killed during the tribulation. That's, if it happens today, that's more than the Holocaust. That's 10 million out of 15 million, and the Holocaust was six million. I don't like this, but it's part of the word. So I can't take it out. I can't rewrite the Bible. And then she said, Think about it. It's a percentage, not a number. And I go like, so what? And she said, well, if it's a percentage, if we lead Jewish people to their Messiah before the rapture, they'll come with us. That percentage remains the same, two to one, but the number can be reduced. And that got me encouraged. And now I'm really excited about getting my people saved. It's amazing you said that. I was actually gonna bring that up without you having to ask it. We talk all the time in the show about the importance of witnessing to the Jewish people is that we can't change the two thirds, but we can change the pool that it's drawing from. Amen. And two thirds of 10 people is way different than two thirds uh, of 10 million people. Right. And so that, that understanding that there's coming a day where this is gonna happen, that puts a timeline that we, we need to get to work. Instead of being afraid, instead of saying, well, I don't know how to, we, we need to truly minister to the Jewish people and share the love of Yeshua with them. Right. Yad Vashem is one of the places that we take you on our tour and it's a place that we cannot not take people to because it's part right. of Jewish history. You, ha you can't understand modern day Israel if you don't understand the horrors that they walk through right. to get them to where they are now. But unfortunately, as, as horrible as the Holocaust was, there are worse days coming, which just right. breaks my heart. The worst is yet to come, Jeremiah 30, verse seven. The eighth, Sarah he le Yaakov, the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time when the beast with his full hatred unleashes through that whore of Babylon, uh, murder, death, destruction on the Jewish people and on the saints of God. 
Revelation 17, 6 says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Revelation 18, 24 says, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all those who were slain on earth. Mm. These, these are the saints uh, who have chosen Yeshua, uh, but don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, of the Ruach HaKodesh. Mm. Uh, for the Jewish people who believed, but after the fact of the rapture, who were stuck in this tribulation, in this time where God pours out his wrath on those who've received the mark and who've chosen Satan, it's, it's the most intense in the history of mankind. It's horrific. Yeah, that's right. uh, Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of his testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. These saints who choose him, who don't have the Holy Spirit, their life is their sacrifice. Yeah. They give their very life for Yeshua, and that is what cleanses them. I was just yeah. going to say, it seems so horrible. The, these beautiful, I mean, you are Jewish. Yeah. Your people have been called out for such a special purpose throughout yeah. throughout history from the be almost the beginning of time and you know all these horrible things have happened to them through through the centuries yeah. the holocaust one of the worst ever as you you can literally see at yad vashem where you walked yeah. and to think it's like gosh isn't enough enough for the jewish people that well, they still have to endure the this. The stubborn hearts, it takes a lot to soften them for them to finally accept and receive Yeshua. Zechariah 13, 8 through 9 describes two thirds perish during this three and a half years, this time of, of Jacob's trouble. And then at the end, that one third is refined by the fire. Uh, they call upon the name of the Lord and they're finally saved, but it takes a lot to get through to them. And this is why we say it's so important that you reach out now so that as many Jewish believers can come to the knowledge of Yeshua now and not have to be in that two thirds of the parish. Yeah. Mm, it's good. We'll be right back. Our resource this week, the book, What Should We Think About Israel? How do you separate fact from fiction in the Middle East conflict? Theologian, archeologist, and research author, Randall Price provides objective facts about Israel's past, present, and future. Look past the heated debates and discern for yourself what is important to know about Israel and how that affects you today. Contact us and ask for the book, What Should We Think About Israel? Well, we made it through today, and I'm hoping that next week may be some better news. Well, yeah, the night is darkest just before the dawn. We went through this so that we can reach that moment, that glorious moment next week. The battle of Armageddon and Yeshua finally comes. You're not going to want to miss this, guys. It's going to be incredible. Thanks for today. It's time to go. Yeah. It is time to go. Until next week, Sha'alu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Our Jewish Roots is a presentation of Zola Levitt Ministries. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your gifts allow us to bring you our weekly television series, social media outlets, website, and other ministry endeavors. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.